So our next talk, I'm, I'm happy to introduce uh, Peter Sarnak. So, so Peter's the uh, Eugene Higgins Professor of Math at Princeton. He's a permanent uh, member, at, uh, faculty member at the Institute for Advanced Study. Um, he was a plenary speaker at the International Congress of Mathematicians in 1998, a winner of the Wolf Prize in 2014, member of the National Academy, et cetera. Um, I think if I went, talked about Peter's honors, we just never get to hear him talk. Um, I want to say on a personal note that I'm visiting the Institute this year on sabbatical, and Peter's one of the people who really makes that place great. I mean, we, we have all these different kinds of seminars, and it, it could be algebraic geometry or machine learning or logic or mathematical physics, and whatever the topic, Peter's just all over, all over it somehow. It's, it's pretty amazing. Anyway, so, so Peter, uh, oh. all right. Thank you, and thanks for the very kind introduction. Do you hear me? Yep. Yeah, okay. Uh, so it's absolutely a great pleasure to be part of this day, a pie day. Um, I should share my screen in a minute, but let me, uh, since I think I'm the last speaker, it seems of the day, I should thank the organizers of what is an amazing day. Uh, again, I don't know how you do it with uh, virtual applause, but uh, I'll, I will clap. <laughs> You've done a great job up until this point. Um, <laughs> So uh, when Rich asked me to speak here, he told me that it was about illusions, magic, number, um, mathematics. And um, he pointed to there being in the theory of numbers, many uh, un unexpected, ad almost identities that people are fascinated by. And uh, he understands I'm not a magician or not in this illusion business. But as I thought about giving this talk, which I was happy to do, um, it occurred to me that pretty much everything we do every day is of this nature. We, we have uh, patterns in front of us and we want wondering if they are true or an illusion. And that's gonna be the theme of my talk. And I will concentrate on uh, some very basic number theory problems. There are many, many of this type, but there are two that are a little dearer to my heart. So I will focus very much on one or two things. So let me try a share screen. And uh, the other thing is, I've given some of these Zooms, I'm not very able with this, but it is extremely, um, so Shiri was able to give a talk there with all these pictures, and uh, but with no feedback directly. So I, don't, uh, I, I just don't know how people do that. So feel free to interrupt. Now, I don't know if you can interrupt directly, but please, if you ask a chat and if the chat comes to, uh, Alexander or somebody, don't be shy to interrupt me because as Rich said, I interrupt everybody. So I should only take the medicine I dish out. Okay, so feel free, uh, you should be following this. Uh, I won't give proofs, I have no plan to give proofs, but you should be understanding what the gist is uh, uh, with the background that you have. I assume sums, I understood now what sum stands for, but for me, sums is a sum. All right, so I'm going to talk about patterns in the theory of numbers. That's my main interest. And ask some questions whether they are misleading or true. Well, today's pi day. Uh, that's pi to a few decimal places. I will use little pi here for pi. I've given a talk with uh, Percy Diacon. He's a public talk at MSRI once and uh, was taught a good lesson there. I, we gave a, uh, I gave a lecture and I was talking about pi, pi being the number of primes less than x, pi goes to infinity when x goes to infinity. And then somebody interrupted me and then said, I thought pi is this number. So I'm going to try to be careful to not make mistakes like that in case there are people who uh, are uh, less, uh, Math is, 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 is less in their mind all day as it is with some of us. So it's Pi Day. It's also, by the way, Einstein's birthday. So we celebrate that around the world too on uh, March 14th. Um, so let me say a few words about Pi because I should probably address the question of uh, illusion or true in, with Pi. And I, I have very little to say, nothing new to say about this for sure. But uh, uh, it has to be brought up. So you might ask, are, are these, so I'm talking about the digits in pi. So I'm, I'm assuming everybody can see the cursor and you can see the numbers here. That's, uh, and, and there are algorithms to compute pi to many, many decimal places. Ramanujan uh, uh, produced some very interesting continued fractions that are used and many other people. 
So you can get these numbers to uh, very, very far out and you can do statistics and see, well, maybe, these, maybe this is eventually a periodic sequence. Well, that's the one thing we do know. We do know that pi is not a rational number. We know it's not a ratio A over Q, A and Q are integers. Um, that was proved by Lambert and it's quite an achievement. And one of the deepest theorems we know in my view in mathematics is the famous Lindemann theorem that pi actually is what's called transcendental. That is, it does not satisfy any equation, uh, finite equation, a polynomial equation with coefficients, which are integers. So it's uh, not an algebraic number, it's transcendental. And that uh, was a very important and dramatic achievement of mankind, actually. Uh, you could ask how, since we know pi is not rational, how close can a rational number get to pi? These are the kind of measure of how irrational you are. And Mahler in 1953 is probably not the world record, but uh, it's, this is quite an achievement, showed that pi over a over, minus a over q, you can't make a rational number closer than q to the minus 42. The exponent there is probably supposed to be two plus epsilon. Those kind of things are just beyond any kind of uh, tools that anybody has. But this is already quite an achievement of Kurt Mahler uh, already in 1953. I don't know the world record. I haven't kept up with that. But the thing that's closest to what I want to talk about today is, is pi sort of a random number? Is it a normal number? That is to say, if I look at the number of ones in this expansion, there should be one tenth of them should be ones. I should have one tenth zeros. I should have one tenth fives and so on. Is this decimal expansion random, at least with respect to the statistic of the number of occurrence of digits? Or if I took pi and I expanded it in base two, would it, be no, would it have the same property? Well, if you do these things, uh, you quickly get, you get convinced very quickly, yes, that's definitely true. But that's not a problem I even, I don't know anyone who even tries to do that. That is just so hard a problem. So it is the kind of question, illusion or true, is pi a normal number? Uh, I think most people would bet yes, uh, but it's not something that we have, uh, what happened? Sorry, your share screening has paused. Why is that? A resume share, sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, that's on Pi Day, we have to ask this question. I have nothing to offer you, but it is the kind of question that I'm gonna ask in another context. Is something that's obviously true, true? And I'm gonna give you examples where don't jump to conclusions too quickly. Okay, so I will turn to one of my favorite functions, uh, even recently has become even more of one of my favorites. It's called the Liouville function. It's just the parity of the number of prime factors of an integer. So if I take an integer n and I factorize it into its prime factors, it's unique up to order, and I just count the number of primes. And I'll, if there's a repeated prime, I count it with multiplicity. I'll go through a few numbers in a second. So for each n, I'll make lambda n minus one to the parity. So it's plus one or minus one. And this actually, uh, whether this is a random function you'll see is kind of central in what we try to do. And proving any kind of randomness is our aim, but we have very few tools to do such a thing, but we can check numerically and that's what we're going to do in a second. So let's just go over this function. So if n is one, well, uh, there are no prime factors, so it's one, two, it's minus one, three, it's minus one, four, there are two factors, so it's one and so on. So it's one minus one minus one and so on. And you can look for a pattern and nobody's ever seen a pattern. There doesn't seem to be any correlation between uh, whether a number has an even or odd number of prime factors, if it's a consecutive and so on. All patterns seem to appear. Some, some progress has been made recently on these kind of problems. So I want to ask is lambda n random, just like we asked about pi or the digits of pi, but that's too hard. So I'm gonna stick to this. We can think of the following problem, which I'm going to illustrate a few things with. Let's take a walk. Suppose I'm a, uh, walking on the integer lattice. I start at the origin. And instead of flipping a coin, as Percy likes to do and interpret everything in terms of a random walk, I'll do also here the same thing, but there's somebody telling me at each move what to move, where to move. So if lambda is n is one, I'll move to the right. If lambda n is minus one, I'll move to the ref, left. And I'll walk along the integer lattice and after m steps i'll be at the point some lambda n n less than or equal to m so 
The question is, is this drunkard lambda, drunken lambda walker walking like a, a random person, a ran, ra random drunkard? That, as Percy said in his lecture, do you come back to where you started? Well, this is a fascinating question, and there's been a, a lot of mistakes made about it, and this will be my first example of illusion or truth. So I'm going to look at L of M, and I calculated L of M. This is this random walk. On the x-axis, I have where I am at nth step. And on the y-axis, I have where the random walker L of M is. So I start off at the origin. The first number was one. I go to one. The second number was minus one. So I walk back to where I started at zero. Third number is a prime. So I'm minus one. So I'm at minus one. I come back. Oh, I got back to the origin. And you zigzag a little bit. Then you go down. Then you go down much further. And if you keep going, you'll see that you don't come back to the axis it looks very much like you're not a drunken walker you seem not to like to go to the right and George Polya who was a plenty good mathematician I had the privilege of meeting him I was a student at Stanford uh, checked checked in 1919 he doesn't seem to be aware of, of, a, of a film of Littlewood I'll describe a little bit later I doubt he would have made this conjecture but anyway he computes by hand those days you computed by hand that for m up to 1500 you were still never crossing back to be positive. So L of M seemed always to be negative once M, well, you're immediately positive, but never again, M greater equal to two. He knew very well that if this were true, then so would the Riemann hypothesis be true, but that's an implication. If this is false, as we'll see, it is false. <laughs> it doesn't mean the Riemann hypothesis is false. So I will return to that. I am not assuming you know what the Riemann hypothesis is, but it is an important problem, and I'll return to it. In, it'll be my final, is it true or not, or is it an illusion question. So by the late 1950s, Alan Turing had his Mark I computer running at Manchester. He had the Institute von Neumann had been building a uh, maniac, but uh, Turing wanted to impress the mathematicians, maybe some of these old uh, hardy Littlewood types, by showing that his machine could... Uh, put to rest some of these illusions that people were seeing, of which one, I believe he was very eager to show the Riemann hypothesis was false by numerically showing it's false, whatever this problem was. So he got his machine running and he and his colleagues worked uh, at a number of these kind of illusory problems. And he, he understood which ones to look at. And you'll see why, because he knew Littlewood quite well. Uh, and by 1958, I think it was, Hazel Grove had shown that Polya's conjecture was false by a theoretical argument. I'm going to explain what's behind this uh, in a moment. Uh, there is a very simple reason why these uh, misleading illusions fooled even people like Polya and many people before him. So it turns out that Polya was wrong. Hazel Grove, Hazel Grove gave an existential proof using a computer. And then computers got better, and Tanaka found the first value at which it came, this random walker finally crossed back to be positive. And it's a nine digit number. So it's quite large. So you can't blame Polya. He was never going to see this happen, but with his hand calculations. Uh, and we see it happen. It's false. And then once it crosses, it walks for a while positive, and then it comes back negative. And I'll tell you a little bit what, what we know about it today. So <clears throat> today, uh, we know much more. So we know that this random walker, this what I call lam lambda drunken walker, will come back to the origin, cross infinitely often back and forth, just like if you were a random drunkard would. Uh, in fact, similar to a drunkard, you would actually get as big as square root m and minus square root m. So there is, it's known that there's a constant which is positive such that L of M will be bigger than square root M infinitely often and less than minus square root. This should be, oh dear. Uh, I have a misprint there, I thought I fixed it. Anyway, that should be square root M. All right, so the drunken walk, walk is looking more like the usual random walk in the sense. But it's clear there's a strong bias to be negative. And Peter Humphreys, who in his undergraduate thesis at ANU, 
um, I gave the Mahler lecture, which is why I had that Mahler number there, and he assisted me, and uh, he'd written a beautiful paper uh, showing that, in fact, you could ask how often is LM negative, which we saw from the beginning, this drunk, it seems to be one to be negative rather than positive or on the left of, of zero rather than on the right. And it turns out that it's not 100%, but it's very close to 100% of the time to three decimal places, it's 0.999. He later came to Princeton and uh, I'm proud to say he wrote a thesis with my uh, some mentoring, let's say. All right, so this uh, is an example of an illusion. Looks like it's true. If you look up to 1500, uh, you get the idea that it's true. In fact, if you looked all the way up to the number less than this nine digit number, you would believe it, but it's actually false. And you can actually see it's false with modern computers. There's a much more dramatic version of this that I want to explain, and it sort of makes you very concerned about um, what we can or cannot see in this world, and you may be fooled, and actually what you think might be true may be true in this universe. May, <laughs> you may never ever see its faults. All right, so now I have big pi. I explained at the beginning, I don't want to make the same mistake. So big pi of x is the number, so I've written out in, in plain uh, language, it's the number of prime numbers which are at most x. It's a function that uh, Gauss studied by doing hand computations, though uh, if you look at the history, it's, uh, it seems like he had some people help him. But he made tables of primes. He was very fascinated by primes. And he was very much into making tables and statistics, by the way. And of course, he did statistics. Uh, a friend of mine, Peter Lax, uh, once said that if Gauss were born in the modern computer era, he would have never left his computer. He would have been a hacker because he really wanted data more than anything else. But maybe we're lucky for that because his contributions to mathematics are unparalleled, except for a guy we're going to see in a minute called Rima, one of his followers. So Gauss makes these tables and he finds that if you're near x, so he's, he's just trying to understand how many primes there are, they get more and more sparse. So pi of x is certainly less than x. And he finds that if x is a large number, the, num the number of primes nearby x is roughly one over log x. Log is to the base e, of course. And his tables confirm this rather accurately. And he conjectures that, therefore, if you integrate one over log t, so this is a, not an elementary function, it's given a name, but it's very easy to compute. Uh, for large values of x, li of x is the integral from 2 to x dt over log t as in calculus. Then he conjectured what is then became known as the prime number theorem that if pi of x is a good approximation, or li of x is a good approximation to pi of x. Or what we call the prime number theorem is that if you take the ratio pi of x divided by li of x, this will tend to 1. Or in another language, we write pi of x is asymptotic to li of x as x goes to infinity. And he couldn't prove this. It took mankind a long time. It was finally proved just before the turn of the, the 1900s by Adamard and de Lavalet Poussin. It was a great achievement based on ideas of Riemann, where Riemann uh, made this Riemann hypothesis, which uh, still not divulging what it is, in order to uh, answer the question of this question of Gauss is the prime number theorem um, true. And his ideas were fundamental in the first proof. It turns out, by the way, that this prime number theorem that I'm talking about here is completely elementarily equivalent to our lambda, drunken lambda walk, not going too far to the right or left. And that is to say that L of m divided by m, not square root m, m goes to zero as m goes to infinity. So that is equivalent to that. So it's not an easy fact, but it shows you how, while L of m, our drunken walker looks like a drunken walker with a slight bias to the left. Uh, proving anything is, is, is highly non-trivial. All right, now there have been many ma tables made of pi and li, starting with Gauss, but of course, then uh, once computers came, these tables can be generated and there's a lot of information. And I wanna just give you a graph by a beautiful paper of Granville and Martin, which is a reference at the end. And at the top here, you see, um, do people see a green, it says you are share screen, sh screen sharing. Okay, I hope you don't see this green in the way that I do. 
Uh, yeah, it, it looks good. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay, so th they're drawing here, not they're drawing lie minus pi. And the story is going to be that pi is always less than li. So they're looking at li minus pi. Here it is, li minus pi divided by li at square root x, which is about square root x. So if you look at this, uh, so the square root x is uh, division here is just, has no uh, relevance for the sign, which is what I'm interested in here, but it does have relevance for the size of the function, which is now roughly bounded. And you can see, this is on logarithmic scale, you're going from 10 to 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 8, and they're drawing this difference. And it seems that li is always bigger than pi, and it's oscillating, and it doesn't seem to want to come down. And if you keep going, it'll stay that way. And if you keep going, it'll stay that way. And mankind has never seen anything but this picture. So illusion or true, <laughs> I guess that's my magic trick for the day. So all tables of pi and past, present, with everything that anybody's ever seen, have pi of x less than li of x for, for every x that's ever seen. And everybody, I think, early on believed maybe that pi was less than li, but not Riemann. Riemann has some very uh, insightful comments that are actually decisive. So this seems to be valid for any x that any human has ever seen or probably will ever see. But that changed in 1914, and this is before Polio's paper, that's why I made that comment. John Littlewood, uh, a brilliant mathematician whose first big paper was, I think, attract, I don't, maybe it didn't attract attention because he wasn't known yet, but looking back, this was a, a major, I, I looked at his math sign at today, and this is certainly his first interesting paper from my point of view, um, proved that actually this changes sign infinitely often. So for infinitely many x, pi will be bigger than li, and conversely, for infinitely many x's, li will be bigger than pi. So this apparent thing that looks to be true is actually false. It's an illusion. Um, so he proved that. I'll say a word in a minute how he proved that. But his proof was not effective. He couldn't tell you when. So everybody's seeing pi is less than li. He couldn't tell you even a number in principle as to when that would happen. Now you might say, how can a guy prove something without being able to say when it'll happen? Not because he's lazy, but in principle. That's because his proof was by contradiction. And he didn't know which route of the argument gets to the answer. So if it went one way, he would be able to tell you if it went the other way, it would depend on some counter example to the Riemann hypothesis, which he doesn't know where it is. So in principle, it was not effective and he wasn't satisfied. And a student of his, he was given the problem, a South African, I'm South African, the excuse was from Cape Town, it's the only problem with him, I'm from Johannesburg. I should say that Littlewood himself was completely formed in, in Cape Town. His, uh, his formative years were in Cape Town. So I claim these guys are both South African too, and they all got interested in this problem and Skews solved the problem. He made, he, he found a very clever way to make it effective. It's clear that even though Skews was a student of Littlewood, if you read Littlewood's miscellany, it's clear that he didn't trust Skews. He doesn't believe him because he was still thinking about how to find his own proof. In any event, Skews wrote down a number before which pi would actually take over li. And it's this number that he wrote down. And it became a joke. I think Hardy commented, this is the biggest number that any human wrote down that served any purpose. It's a big number. It's bigger than anything that you would ever see on a computer. And today we understand when this first sign change is almost certainly going to happen. It's vicinity. And it's at about 10 to the 380. Now that's a very big number. You can't the, the number of steps to compute pi of x is square root x, the best algorithm known. But even if it were faster, you don't know what x to choose. So when you're talking about numbers this big, we're never going to see that sign change. So somehow in this world, pi is always less than li. I think if you based any theory on which pi was less than li, you wouldn't ever be found to be wanting. But it's false. So this is kind of the most dramatic illusion that we know, meaning it's false, but you'll never see it. Or I shouldn't say things like you'll never see it. It's going to take a long time before anybody sees the first value at which this changes sign. And again, you can work out the probability. This was done by Rubinstein and myself early on. 
And uh, we were trying to explain uh, how often is pi bigger than li or li, li bigger than pi and li is bigger than pi almost 100% of the time. But now you can see it's many decimal places. All right. Now, it's amazing that we can make these statements. It's amazing that Littlewood could make that statement without going and computing pi, as, as Polya was doing. And there's a very simple reason, and that's because Riemann understood how to write these expressions as some kind of oscillatory sum over the zeros of a function. He didn't know much about the zeros. That's why he made this famous hypothesis. But let me just tell you the nature of the way he writes it down. So if you look at pi of x minus li of x, the thing whose sign changes we're looking for, and you divide by square root x. So this function, as you increase x, it's a discontinuous function. Li is continuous, but pi jumps at each prime power, prime. Uh, if you look at this function and you ask about the sign changes, it turns out that there is a bias. It's explained by Riemann very clearly, Riemann's formula. So the, its mean value is minus one. That's why this thing wants to be negative. And then it's got an oscillatory term with some coefficients that could be very complicated in these problems, but is not so complicated in the case that it would dealt with. And then there's, I'll assume Riemann, because if Riemann's false, then these oscillations are much bigger and the result is easier to obtain. So the hard case is when the Riemann hypothesis is true. And then this is roughly a bounded function, but it's got infinitely many frequencies and these frequencies are not known. They are these numbers, the zeros, the ordinates of the zeros. And I want to just say one thing which explains the whole illusion. And that's, uh, it's coming from one basic source. You have a bias towards negative one, and then you have these coefficients. They're rather small for zeta. That's a remarkable thing, but their sum is infinite the sum of the absolute values. And then you have cosines. So this is like a trigonometric sum with some frequencies which are incommensurable. So you would expect that if you took log x large enough, you would line up all these cosines, maybe even with the a gammas and force this eventually to beat minus one and cross the axis. And that's exactly what Littlewood was able to prove with an ingenious argument. That was how he showed a change sign infinitely often. But notice the natural variable here is log x, not x. And that's why this, whatever you're looking at, changes so slowly. And that's why you have to wait to 10 to the 380, because log of 10 to the 380 is not such a big number. And so the natural fluctuations are occurring at log and small numbers, log doesn't change much when X changes numerically. And this was what fooled everybody. Uh, and it's amazing how many, I just mentioned Polya, there were three or four other famous mathematicians who also made this uh, false conjecture. In fact, one called Stulchis even claimed to prove one of these conjectures, <laughs> including much stronger statements in the Riemann hypothesis. So. Uh, there's an illusion here. We understand today where it's coming from. It is not necessarily easy to use a computer to disprove it because we don't know how to line up these frequencies in general. So uh, there's something called Merton's conjecture. It was proved to be false using the triple L algorithm uh, by computing 20 zeros of the Riemann zeta function to 20 decimal places and then looking for linear relations amongst these ordinates in order to line up these frequencies of their certain smoothness. All right, uh, but if you change Merton's a little bit, uh, I'm just talking uh, generalities, you can imagine this, then all of a sudden you can't use a computer to disprove it. But it's clear that these uh, oscillations are gonna be arbitrarily big and arbitrarily small. So it's all about beating this minus one and this numbers are very small and that's the source of this misunderstanding there's nothing wrong with the Riemann hypothesis but there is this bias is clearly explained and the log is what I wanted to explain that okay that was the first of what I wanted to explain and it's exactly halfway through although I think I only have 20 minutes and now in Diophantine equations there are slews and slews of examples of conjectures based on small numbers which were false they seem to be obviously true but if you wait or search far enough with modern computers, they turn out to be false. Uh, I don't uh, even uh, conjectures of people like Euler that elk is disproved and things like that. But I want to focus on a very basic question and it's become my favorite over many year, recent years. 
And it's which numbers are sum of three cubes. And here we're going to get to the point where mankind will be like with pi and the question of um, is it a normal number? And not only that, but Mordell, who, who highlighted this problem, said it reminds these two problems look to him like they're the same. All right, before I ask which numbers are sum of three cubes, let's ask which numbers are sum of squares, because that's a big chapter, which is well understood, starting with Fermat. And it will uh, give a, us a flavor of what we would like to see as true. So Fermat determined which numbers are sum of two squares. He did it as follows. First, uh, to write k as the sum of two squares, he observes k must be non-negative because everything, real numbers, sum of squares must be non-negative. There will be another obstruction, not just be positive, that's got to do with numbers working with numbers which are three mod four. He also observes that if k is a product of prime numbers, then you can use uh, the product of uh, the length squared of complex numbers or this identity here, which will show that if I can dis if I can solve x squared plus y squared equals a prime and another prime, then I can write it as <laughs> some two squares as well. So the problem reduces to prime numbers immediately. And for a prime, Fermat proves, observes the following. And this is a very, uh, please keep with me here because we're going to be seeing this, uh, this notion over and over again. And we saw it in the second lecture as well with GCDs and things like that. So if we have, uh, when I write a number as a, a prime, as a, so, okay, two can be written as a sum of two squares. And if P gives remainder three when divided by four, it cannot be a sum of two squares because if I look at the numbers modulo four, so I'm going to be doing, when I say modulo, I mean, I do arithmetic, uh, keeping only the remainders on division by whatever I say modulo. So if I say modulo four, there are only three, uh, four possible remainders, zero, one, two, or three. And so then I can compute by hand, and if it's four, even in my head, and see what's going on. So if x squared plus y squared were equal to p, where p is three mod four, and I looked at everything in the remainders mod four, mod four, I would check then that the squares of numbers modulo four are zero, one, and two. And, not, and so two of them can't add up to, sorry. There is zero and one, they can't add up to three. So uh, three, uh, if P is three mod four, it cannot be written as a sum of two squares. And that's, I will call a local congruence obstruction. And these are easy to compute. And if P is one mod four, there's no local congruence obstruction. And there's Fermat's big observation. This is highly non-trivial. He showed that if P is a prime, which is one mod four, then there are two numbers, X1 and x2, such as the integers. The Diophantine equation means I'm solving up the integers, such as p is a sum of two squares. And this way, he determined which numbers are sum of two squares. All right, how about three squares? This is Gauss's favorite theorem. I'll explain why in a minute. And while this number, uh, the Fermat's theorem is in many elementary number theory courses, Gauss's theorem is hardly covered. It's quite a bit deeper. It's not hard, but it's quite a bit deeper. So if we ask which numbers are sums of three squares rather than two squares, then again, it better be non-negative. And again, we can compute what's modulo something, we may have problems. And it turns out, and these modulo questions are easy to answer in closed form, especially for three variables. And it turns out that uh, if you work modulo eight, you'll see that the squares are zero, one, or four and so now three of them can add up to seven mod eight so any number which gives remainder seven when divided by eight is not a sum of three squares and you can check that any number of the form four to the eight times eight b plus seven this is a number that gives remainder seven when divided by eight are never sums of three squares and so people mankind uh, people around Fermat, Gauss and Euler probably felt and that's correct that is it true that if you're not of this form that you're sum of three squares and the answer is yes. And this is Gauss's favorite theorem in his Disquestionis Arithmetica. He calls it Eureka. He, uh, his Disquestionis was his diary. And that day he says, Eureka, I finally proved this. This is one of the things he was really after. He was very young. And it's one of his great achievements, actually. So if a number is not of the form 4 to the 8 into 8b plus 7, then it is a sum of 3 squared. That is as good as the world could be. There's a local obstruction. If it's passed, 
then we have a global solution. Very happy. And if you, uh, I, but the mankind then spent many years trying to understand Hilbert's 11th problem is a generalizing this kind of problem. Ziegel spent many years on it about which numbers are sums of squares and quadratic forms. Which numbers are sum of three cubes? That's my other question. I allow negative numbers. I must emphasize that. There is this tradition of what's called the wearing problem of the British, where they insist that the numbers be non-negative. So you have to write it as a sum of three positive cubes. That is also interesting, but not the problem I want to discuss, because that restricts the variables to be positive. And in fact, it would take away all my thunder here. All right, so we allow negative numbers everywhere. So we're solving over the integers, not over the natural numbers. So again, we can check, and I'll let you do this. If you do arithmetic modulo nine, you'll find that you never get uh, four or five when you add three cubes. So that you do go home and check. And interestingly, that's the only obstruction. So we check this. So that's a local obstruction. So if K were four or five mod nine, we, we, we give up. Uh, it's clear we have a very simple answer. You aren't a sum of three cubes. But for every other, if I work modulo, any other number. So I'm treating this modulo stuff as easy. And that doesn't mean it's easy because these numbers Q are big. And if Q is a prime, then you're solving equations over finite fields, a, a very important subject in modern number theory. But for these kind of equations, counting the number of solutions of a large finite field is very easy. It's a diagonal equation. We understand exactly how many solutions there are. And it turns out there are no other local obstructions. There is no other congruence that will give you any trouble. And so every number which is four or five modulo nine cannot be written as a sum of three cubes. And as far as mankind knows, this is my big true or not, true or false, admissible. Is it possible So this, that every number which is not four or five mod nine is a sum of three cubes? Is this an illusion? Was this an absolute beautiful truth? So we discussed sum of three squares and what's true with the sum of three cubes. And mankind has no clue. This is a wildly difficult problem that, as I said, Mordell said, looks as hard as proving that pi is a normal number. But there's been some very exciting in progress recently and I wanted to discuss that with you and uh, then give you my guess here. Uh, and it's based on some uh, work of uh, Andrew Booker, actually a former PhD student of mine as well. So a few years ago, Booker shocked the community and there's a something called number file. You should read, go watch it. It's fantastic. And they uh, Browning explains this problem. Booker got interested. You put Booker with his genius and a computer in his office and he comes out with amazing stuff. He can somehow work these two things together. So of course, this problem was around, it's been around for uh, 100, 100 years or so, which numbers are sum of three cubes. We know four or five or not. And people then looked on a computer. I mean, let's see what's true by seeing what's illusion. <laughs> Is it illusory or not? And it turned out that, all right, you take numbers K less than 100, for example, uh, you could try go find a solution by looking for x1, x2, x3 in a certain box. And then use your fancy, uh, computers are quite good now. You could go up to numbers which have 12 digits, 13 digits. At first, there were only seven digits. And there were two numbers. And every number which was not four or five modulo nine, so I'll call those admissible. Every admissible number was found to be a sum of three cubes, except 33 and 42. And that was stuck for about 20 years. And that's what Booker found. And uh, I can tell you a story. I have a student who's writing a thesis on these kind of problems. And he, at some point, emailed me. And he just emailed me this. I said, where do you get that? <laughs> this is one of those amazing things that uh, it's very easy to verify this is correct. You can do this on your calculator. But there's no clue as to how, who, how it was found. Anyway, he. Uh, told me this and then eventually uh, after a few hours said oh it's somehow he thinks it's booker so of course then i checked and indeed it had come out a little earlier on some on the web before he'd wanted because he was still trying to do this 42. anyway he found a solution and he he comes uh, with a new algorithm which allows him to compute 
roughly if the minimum the min say so you're looking for x1 x2 x3 and he can his algorithm works uh, if it's gonna it can calculate whether this is a solution this is the smallest solution so you can see why people didn't find it that easily it's a 17 digit number i think or 16 and he can compute uh, his algorithm runs in roughly uh, 10 he can do it in 10 to the 16 or maybe 10 to the 18 steps and that's the kind of thing that if you run your computer for a few weeks and eventually here in Sutherland run uh, they they do they run this with other people with many machines is almost in the ballpark in terms of what you can compute so he finds a new algorithm uh, which allows him to find this solution and solve 33. Uh, 42, as he joked, and as people joke, is some number from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So you had to find 42. And I'll explain to you why these numbers are hard in a minute. Uh, and they found a solution, him and Andrew Sutherland at MIT. And they have a beautiful paper in the Proceeding of the National Academy, which I have a reference at the end. And another solution they found with this crowdsourcing com computations is, and this model highlighted. So if we want to write three as the sum of three cubes, that's not hard. Uh, one plus one plus one. <laughs> and a little less clear is that other solution, uh, which you can check for four minus five. And then as Model understood, and I'll explain to you why in a second, nobody could find a solution. And in fact, the solution is abnormally large. And so Model thought nobody would ever find a solution. Whether he thought there is a solution is another matter. He doesn't really say. But here is they found the first smallest solution. And it's already 21 digits long. So this was uh, took them longer, but they uh, found. So these were small cases for which people had asked if there are solutions. And uh, numerically, they are searching, but searching in a very, very clever way. So what is going on here? I want to try to explain at least what's going on. And is every number sum of three cubes, which is not four or five mod nine? All right, so there's one thing that we do know. So in this kind of problem, the first thing you do is you look at the numbers modulo, uh, 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 you look for parity discrepancy. Like if you're trying to solve such an equation, the left-hand side's even, the right-hand side's odd, you don't have solutions. And that's what this modulo Q argument is just a generalization of that. You look for these local obstructions. There could be a much more subtle obstruction, which uses a reciprocity. So there's the famous Gauss reciprocity that if P, if you're looking in arithmetic modulo P and arithmetic modulo Q and P and Q are both primes, say, which give remainder one when divided by four, then P's have got a square root modulo Q if and only if Q has got a square root modulo P. Now that is not something that you can see locally by just looking at P and Q. That's something that's global that actually, and I see I'm using all my hands, like Shiri says, uh, you're not seeing it, but I'm doing it below the surface here. Um, this uh, reciprocity deserves the hands. It's a, a very deep thing and it's a global thing. And uh, one can show sometimes that there aren't solution to equation because of some kind of reciprocity. It's the general name buzzword that goes here is called uh, Brouwermannian obstruction. And Castles found such a re use of cu cubic reciprocity that if you write threes, the sum of three cubes, then while there's no forcing that the three numbers must be congruent modulo nine, every solution will have that. That's an extra obstruction. And it's not a local obstruction, and it's what's making the solutions extremely sparse because they all have to be one, uh, equal to each other modulo nine, as you can check this big fat number is, as is one, 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 and four, four minus five. So this is the reason that Model highlighted that exact thing. And there are generalizations of that which show why 42 and 33 were such problematic ones because the global reciprocity prevents certain congruence classes making them much more sparse but it doesn't prevent the existence of a solution so if somebody were to solve if you told me somebody solved this problem of which numbers are sum of three cubes i would guess that it would be in the negative and they find some k that is not a sum of three cubes admissible k for the reason of some reciprocity but the usual reciprocities don't succumb they don't divulge this they just prevent certain things like they 
produce things like this. So algebra hasn't been able to deal with this and computers have given us some solutions. And there's a beautiful conjecture of Heath Brown that I want to explain. And this explains what's going on here and why when you make your guess here, true or false, illusion or not, uh, this is what I would take into account. And it's the following. Suppose you count the number of solutions. So uh, remember, we're allowing negative numbers. So we can't check for any K. We have no decision procedure for any K because there are infinitely many numbers to check. But we can look at the numbers in a big box and we can try count how many solutions there are. And thanks to the case of quadratic forms, there is a meta philosophy as to what you should expect the number of answers to be if the world were nice to you. And that expectation comes from a very natural, and this is why number theory is so beautiful. We count the number of solutions to the equation one over the reals, and we compute some volume, uh, infinite density calculation. We then compute the number of solutions to this equation modulo p to a large power, where the power gets large, which is the same as solving this equation in the field instead of the reals, but called the p-addicts. But you don't need to know what they are. It's just a version of this. And you, get, you can count that. And all these are easy calculations. And you count the number of solutions uh, locally over the reals, locally over the p-addicts. And then you do something incredible. You multiply those numbers together as if they things are independent. And, it, and amazingly, for quadratic forms, it gives you the answer. <laughs> this infinite product gives you the exact integer count. And here, we can still believe, and there are varieties for which these kind of things are true, that maybe when B gets large, the count is accurate, and that these local products give you the thing. If you compute this, this you'll find that the number of solutions in a box grows like something which the uh, row of k, which is basically bounded and not zero, if k is not, if k is admissible. And then this is what makes this problem so challenging and beautiful, is it grows like log. It's our, it's our log again that was always misleading us or leading us. If it were bounded there, analysis would, you, you, you wouldn't, there would be only finitely many solutions, maybe tough. But there's a log there. That means that if you do this yoga, you expect the number of solutions to be infinite, but very sparse, only logarithm number in a big box. And that's why, and it's completely consistent with what Booker and uh, Sutherland are finding that in a big box, they only log B. And they go now with all the data that's available and check if this conjecture is true on this sum of three cubes. And they don't have that much data, but they based on the data they have, it's very convincing that this conjecture, which was made by Heath Brown, that the number of solutions would grow like this. So not only would the original problem of K being a sum of three cubes have an integer solution, it would have infinitely many solutions growing like log B with some constant when B goes to infinity. So you see, we do have a theory. It, this uh, kind of method, uh, trying to prove this is, seems hopeless by the techniques we have. But the numerics indicates that this is probably really what's going on. It certainly explains the numerics. And in fact, it even predicts how far they would have to go. So they knew how far roughly they would have to go to get this number. They knew that they're going for a 21-digit number. So they knew how many processes they needed to put together there. Um, I see I'm running out of time here. So, um, so I would say that the answer to this, true or false, is, uh, is this an illusion or not? Uh, I think with this theory, and if you were to ask me at this point, my guess is yes, every, uh, the world is beautiful. There's a local to global principle for sum of three cubes, but that's probably naive. And uh, with time, maybe we'll fall down with some counter example down the road, but it looks not unreasonable. All right, I'll spend just another two minutes. I want to say what this Riemann hypothesis is because uh, it is, uh, I mentioned it, and as far as I'm concerned, it's the most important illusionary problem that exists. And many people, of course, view that similar. So it's considered a major unsolved problem. It can be stated in terms of this random lambda walk. And it's just the following statement, but when stated this way, it's completely misleading. Why is this an important problem? Why is it true? Anyway, it's completely equivalent to the following, that the, our random lambda walker would go at most square root m away from where they started, just like a random drunkard would. 
uh, after M steps. You have to put a safety valve of an epsilon here, otherwise it's false. So it's not quite the random guy. And with a random guy, there would be extra logs here, but you actually have to put that there to say this equivalence. So that's one way I can tell you what the Riemann hypothesis is without ever saying anything about it. But that's not why this is a great problem. Uh, because firstly, it's not falsifiable. I don't like conjectures which are not falsifiable. This, this constant C is not explicated. So the original formulation by Riemann when he was trying to prove the prime number theorem is he introduced properties of this function. This is a sums. I'm allowed to write an infinite sum. It's a sum of n to the minus s. That's the famous Riemann zeta function. And he introduced the complex variable into this problem. This function makes sense as a complex variable and is essentially got a polar one and otherwise entire. And his big hypothesis, not conjecture, because it was convenient for what he was trying to do, prove the prime number theorem, is that the real part of all the non-trivial zeros are on the line of half. Now that's very falsifiable. You can compute these zeros one after the next. And in fact, this is what Turing started. He wanted to find a zero off the line. So he got his machine, his Mark I, and that's really where he put his effort. Today, we know that the first, if you go up in imaginary part, the first 10 to the 10, 12 zeros are on the line. Ogliska looked around the 10 to the 20th zero and 70 million neighbors, they're all on the line. You, to go from 10, you know, uh, this is, he did this quite a while ago. Today, I think there are multi crowding people computing that too. So the zeros are on the line, a lot of them are on the line. Turing didn't come with, to convince anybody it was false. Uh, certainly not by demonstrating a zero off the line. So is the Riemann hypothesis an illusion or true? That is, uh, that's, <laughs> I think, a very important question. Well, the one thing you should be aware of is that the, the fact that somebody's checked the first 10 to the 12 zeros and they're all on the line is not so convincing because that's exactly, there may be some feature like Littlewood's theorem that you in for a shock. The real reason people like me believe this conjecture is that the analog in other settings has been proven to be true and decisive and fundamental in terms of mathematics. It's also a very powerful tool. So we want it to be true. For example, the best results that are actually proved about sum of three cubes due to Hooley use the Riemann hypothesis. So it's, uh, it's a tool that it's a beautiful conjecture. It's falsifiable. It's true. If true, it's extremely powerful. So the boxed question is the Riemann hypothesis an illusion or true is to many of us a religion. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, yeah, and I'll uh, obviously entertain any questions. You didn't interrupt me. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so here are some references to. Yeah. So there, there's a very beautiful paper about this pie and lie by Granville and Martin. There's this paper of Peter Humphreys I mentioned, and this recent paper of Booker and Sullivan has all the references. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Sarnak. Um, sure. uh, we have a few questions already. Um, one question I had is, how far can this pi and lie difference get above zero? I'm not sure. Yeah, if you... yeah. That's a, so if the Riemann hypothesis is true, it gets to at most x to the half plus epsilon. So it will grow basically like square root. So if you take pi minus lie divided by square root x, it's going to be, it's not bounded, we can show that, but it'll grow very slowly and it's, it's really an almost periodic function. So it's, uh, it, but not in the sense of uniformly almost periodic. So you should view it as being size square root x. But it comes down to zero and crosses. So it, the upper envelope is square root, certainly x to the half plus epsilon, the lower envelopes x to, minus x to the half plus epsilon and there are if you actually want to know the exact behavior there's a lot of debate very little in the way of proof proof because even the x to the half is equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis but there are conjectures that if you assume all sorts of random matrix conjectures there are some nice predictions cool um one of our audience members asks about uh the twin prime conjecture yeah. Zhang's paper and reduction of the bound to 
something. Um, okay. Do you think that the, the yes, do you think that the Elliot yeah. Haberstam conjecture could be proved, or would it require another? No. No, 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 no. Okay. Good question. Firstly, I think they talk, whoever's asking is talking about Yitang Zhang who proved bounded gaps. So the approaches to twin prime. So uh, there's a good reason I put this function as important. This parity, this parity is the most uh, notorious difficulty in the, in the subject. It, you saw it here in terms of the size of the summary function at the bottom. When you try to do twin primes, which would be essentially the problem lambda n, trying to understand the averages of lambda n correlated against lambda n plus one quantitatively. We have recent beautiful progress if you do what are called logarithmic averages on conjectures of Elliot, myself. These are works by uh, Matomaki, uh, Radzivil and Terry Tao and, uh, and many other co-workers these days, but they're all for the logarithmic average and they never tackle the parity. And nor does Yang's work, uh, Yang, Zhang's work tackle the parity. So before Zhang, uh, even today, I would say the best result towards the twin prime conjecture. So before Zhang, people who tried to prove the twin prime conjecture tried to show their infinite set of numbers P, such that P and P plus two are prime. And failing that, you approximate the problem. So the standard approximation was, let's try to show that there are infinitely many primes such that the set P is a prime and P plus two is a product of at most two primes. It's a very famous theorem of Chen from China achieved under quite difficult conditions and correctly celebrated. And I still think is the best result towards a twin prime conjecture. Okay, it's an approximation. The second number is not a prime, but it's a product of the least number before you would be sure that you had the answer. Well, you could try approximate the problem a different way. And then there's different ways to say, can you find numbers such that the first number is a prime and the second number is not P plus two, but at most P plus a hundred. And that Jang, what Jang proved. And I think the question was, how far can you reduce a hundred to try, so you now come back and try to get to twin prime P, P plus two instead of P, P plus 100 or whatever the world record is. It's well understood that when you get down between P, P plus four and P plus two, you'll face the parity problem, which is a problem in civ theory that prevents you from recognizing whether a number is an even or odd number of prime factors. And uh, Zhang's work doesn't address that uh, and nor did uh, Chen's work and that is the main stub and all these recent results on Elliot uh, in averaged form are getting further and further away because they uh, get away from parity. So the parity problem remains the main difficulty and nobody has uh, got, I think, closer at all. Thank you. Um, one of our own faculty asked, uh, <laughs> uh, what could we salvage um, from all of these uh, results if we if the Riemann hypothesis is false and we only know it's true up to a certain point? For yeah, uh, I was thinking that myself as I was presenting this as a, as a, may be true in this world, but not. Uh, that's a good question because when we work in the subject, we even make an a notation that I warn students is incredibly dangerous. We write A is less than less than B by saying A is less than or equal to a constant times B where that constant doesn't depend on anything I've been talking about up until this point. Uh, and if it does depend on something, there would be a little notation to remind us. But we do that because we don't ever want to try to see when things kick in because it's so painful. So everything we do is studied only in the limit. And so it would be very hard to go to theorems and say, ah, suppose the Riemann hypothesis is true up to this point, and can I use it from there? But on the other hand, if the Riemann hypothesis is false, false, you can use a zero off the line to do amazing things. So uh, if ever, anybody ever found a zero off the line, especially near the point one for a certain kind of L function, it would repel, it would force you to have much better control later. So these are kind of proofs which become ineffective uh, that 
I don't know who the faculty member asked me, but if it's Hofstein, he's one of the world experts on this, yeah. then he, uh, if you, you, you can use the Riemann hypothesis is false in your favor, rather than knowing it's true up to a certain point. Um, and uh, maybe a variant on this question is uh, Selberg is very famous for proving that there are a positive proportion of the zeros of the Riemann zeta function are on the line of heart. It was a fantastic achievement in terms of the technology invented, but it's entirely useless. You tell me, it's not how many zeros on the line, it's how many are off that are much more useful in terms of application. So the question is a fair question, but uh, nobody keeps track of constants in this. That's, if we were in a position where we knew something that was very interesting that followed from checking the first. Okay, so uh, I could answer one question. Uh, it was shown by Vinogradov that every odd number is a sum of three primes if it's bigger than 10 to the 300 or something. Uh, by the time that proof was finished, maybe. Uh, and then what about between one and or 10 uh, and 10 to the 380? Well, uh, that's uh, how do you go and check so many numbers? And that was done by Harold Helfgott, who then completed the solution of this sum of three primes. And for that, he needed to compute zeros and know that the, no, uh, no, uh, these computa numerical computations were absolutely input. So the answer is yes, it has been used in that kind of form. As the final thing where we get down to numbers which are human, yeah. That's a good point I should have maybe even highlighted. Thank you. Um, someone asks, just can you give more explanation of the words you of the phrases you used, uh, local and global, yes. in the terms in terms of uh, working modulo primes? Yes, that's the most important thing that you can take in. It's elementary. So let's go to uh, Gauss's theorem, which is Eureka theorem. So. Ignore the four to the eight, just because if k is uh, gives remainder seven when divided by eight, then I can't solve sum of three squares equals seven because if I just take this equation, if I had an integer solution and I looked at modular eight at the remainders when divided by eight, I would get seven for k, and I would get and then I go through the possibilities for x1, x2. And if you go through that, you'll see you'll never get seven. The only, you can choose x1 between zero and seven, x2 between zero and seven. But when you square them, you only get the numbers zero, one, and four. Because three squared is nine, which is one. And so, so you never get seven. So we learn, and this is a simple variation, that if k is of this form, there's a local obstruction. So the statement of a local to global, which has the flavor also of complex analysis where you're making zeros and trying to and find a global function which has no poles, uh, is the statement that if K does not have this local obstruction, so we don't know any obvious reason why K can't be a sum of three squares, then in fact, there are three integers. Now you don't write them down. You give a proof by counting a pigeonhole argument or some variant on that. So uh, we call it a local to global principle. I think that was a question in the sense that there's a local obstruction. If the local obstruction is passed, is that the only obstruction? If that's the case, we say that the equation has a local to global principle. Local obstruction passed, we find a global solution or there exists. It's very rare that the form, uh, a formula is written down for the answer. It's more that you prove by some other reasoning that there must be a solution. And by the way, we know roughly how many solutions there will be, quite a few compared. Uh, this is a much easier problem. If you look how often you're going to hit K, just probabilistically, you'll see it's roughly square root of K, while in the sum of three cubes, we're only hitting it logarithmically. And that's a very big difference. So that's why the sum of three cubes is... And by the way, I should have said that if you uh, take equations and make them higher degree, then there are theorems about there only being finitely many solutions. Those are the finiteness theorems of, for curves and for high, high dimensions, there are very few theorems, but they are very beautiful conjectures, for example, of Voita. 
but we are in the situation where none of those we are the these the equation sum of three cubes is a threshold situation so i hope i explained what local to global is in this example yeah. and varieties which satisfy local to global principles are called they satisfy what we often call the Hasse principle because he showed that's true for quadratic forms of a, a field of a global field it's called the Hasse Minkowski theorem. Thank you so much, Professor Sarnak. Um, I'd like to invite all of the people who still have questions um, and anyone who would like to hear more discussion uh, to join us on Gather Town after this, uh, including you, Professor Sarnak. I'd love to hear more about this. Um, okay, uh, I, I'm, uh, I know Rich has forced me to come to Gather Town at institute meetings and I'm still nervous, but I'll be happy to stay here if you leave this on for another 10, 15 minutes so that people can just quiz me. That's fine with me if, if that suits you. Before before uh, more of our participants leave, uh, we have past five, and I think that some people's schedules have run out. I just want to thank all of our student volunteers. We've had so much dedication over this whole year. Um, no, no one expected sums really to happen. Um, especially like this. Uh, this is the biggest sums that we've ever had um, in the time when we thought the least connection and ability to have a conference was possible. Um, so I'd like to just thank the math department, the math Doug, every one of our student volunteers, ISERM, the ATMA department, uh, anyone who sent out an email about sums ever. And I sent out a lot of them um, and everyone else on the team did too. Um, so please join us on Gather Town to play games, to talk about math, to talk about anything. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, th thank you, Alexander. I feel like you did a good chunk of the work for this. So. So also just to clarify, on Gather Town, we will have different meeting rooms dedicated to specific activities. They'll be able to say talking about research, talking about applying to grad school or choosing which grad school to go to. And then um, I and other students will be running one that's just fun, non-math related games. You just want to relax. So so Peter, I have a question. Yeah, I'm yeah. <laughs> what so yeah, so I, I know how Fermat's little theorem works, but what, what goes into Gauss's uh, yeah. theorem? Yeah, like, so what, what's Gauss, the math? I mean, uh, this Gauss, uh, he made a change of variable. So, this particular equation, but it's very, very special. If you change, say, the quadratic form from x squared plus y squared plus z squared to 2x squared plus y squared plus z squared, this fails. Oh, I see. So found, this is Okay, so it's like which integers are realized by this particular quadratic this form? Right. Yeah. He found a change of variable from this three by three to representing two by two. So it's an algebra computation that works over the integers. And he proved the following statement that the number, the, the number of ways of uh, the, the class number. So suppose you want to write uh, k as a sum of three squares. Yeah. If you look at minus k, or maybe there's a four you have to put in there. Okay. And you ask about the number of binary quadratic forms of discriminant minus k, four k. Okay, so, I guess I know what that means. That the discriminant's like the like the determinant, right? Right. So you're less. looking up to equivalence in SL two z uh, of these forms. Yeah. Uh, and the linear change of variable. This is what he studied early in the book. So his book is about binary forms. And then all of a sudden he starts talking about higher uh, three by three quadratic mm -hmm. forms. And he makes a change of variable. And I'll tell you exactly what it's related to. The discriminant of a binary quadratic form is B squared minus four AC. Yeah. And so that's a quadratic form in three variables. And so he observes the change of variable, which allows him just for this sum of three squares to make a change of variable and prove the following identity that the number of representations of minus 4k by the quadratic form sum of three cubes is equal to 
um, the number, um, the class number of this quad quadratic form of discriminant minus 4D. And that class number is not, is always at least one. So there's this, so he's got a correspondence between the solutions. Now, if you work globally, I, I just want to point out that this is a miracle. There are only finitely many forms for which this is true, ternary forms. So the, the, the thing that's always true, and this is what Ziegel understood, mm -hmm. the thing that's absolutely always true, I see Conrad, Keith. Yeah, so I'll be happy to answer any question he has. Um, but I also want to answer students' questions. <laughs> okay, anyway. Like well, no, 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 no. Let me answer this question. Later, this question is very important because it's my favorite theorem. It's called the Ziegel mass formula. And the Ziegel mass formula says that the number of ways you can represent a number by a quadratic form over the integers, that is not e an easy question. But if you sum over the genus, meaning you look at all quadratic forms which are locally the same, if they and but not necessarily globally the same, there are finitely many such forms. Wait, what does it mean to be locally the same? So take a, a, a x squared plus y squared plus z squared and look at all quadratic forms over the integers in three variables, which if I look at it over the reals is uh, I see equivalent. What you mean. Gotcha. Yes. Then I look at it over every periodic integrally and so locally the same at every place. Yeah. Then there are only finitely many different equivalence classes. Uh, you obviously can change from one form to another by GLNZ. Yeah. But there are only finitely many such classes. That's Hermit, Minkowski, etc. So that class number could be big, and it is big in these things. But uh, so what Ziegel showed, and this is called the Ziegel mass formula, that the number of represent representations of a number, any quadratic form, any number of variables. So it contained everything anybody had done before. The, the number of representations by a quadratic form integrally, that's tricky. But if you sum over the genus, so you add over all the inequivalent guys, then that's given by a product of local masses. And I so see. It's the, the same thing you were talking about before. Take, this. Yeah, so that, that exact product of local masses. I said it. I was lying. You have to sum over the genus. But the miracle about sum of three squares is the class numbers one. And Gauss secretly is proving that in his change of variable. So there are only uh, there may be three or four quadratic forms in three variables which are definite, which are class number one. Maybe one only. Sorry, maybe, maybe it's only sum of three squares. So he stumbled across the one that you can write down exactly the answer. So if you take a so let me repeat. So if you take a quadratic form which um, his class number, you take a form for which there are two in the class, Ziegel will tell you one of the two represents whatever it's supposed to represent. But one still has a positive answer, and this is a work of Duke, myself, Piotrowski, Shapiro. This completely solves Hilbert's 11th problem, which was exactly do you have a local to global principle over the integers? So if you read any book, they'll say that Hassas proved the Hilbert's 11th problem. It's not true. Uh, has to solved it over the rationals of a field and over the integers, which Hilbert asked specifically, it's much, much harder. And it uses all the stuff that was developed by Ivan H. Duke, myself in the 90s. Yeah. So it's still true, but there could be finitely many exceptions. So what I'm, what's amazing is Gauss found, he didn't know, uh, I mean, he, he maybe he knew it, but he found this miracle with the sum of three squares. And you know, every mathematician who's a number theorist writes in their old age about this. Shimura, Bay, the Knezer, they all want to give it their own proof of this theorem of Gauss. They view that as the pinnacle. It's kind of an amazing theorem. Right. No, because for some of four squares, you, it, it's sort of related to this geometric thing about lattice point counting. And, uh, uh, the, the, the geometry of numbers yeah. is so Ziegel's theorem. But the, what's remarkable is, it as is, Ziegel says, is you, you should read so the, these lectures. Hey, like you, I should let you answer someone else's yeah, question. Yeah, yeah OK, let me answer any other question. The question. Yeah, but the sum of three cubes might go this way. It's amazing if that's true. I mean, this is just, it's probably an illusion. <laughs> I like the fact that you forced me to think about magic. <laughs> yeah. You knew I'd get to the Riemann hypothesis. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you were going to talk about factoring. Anyway, yeah, said, yeah. I, I take another question. Yeah, uh, you guys, anybody should leave there. I don't want to keep people here. I'll come to the Gather Town a little bit. It's not my 
cup of tea, but <laughs> I'll get myself a real cup of tea. Uh, but uh, if there's somebody who has uh, technical questions, or especially about the lecture, I want to answer, yeah. Anyway, I just want to say it was great. I mean, thanks. Okay, thanks a lot. Well, I, I think the other talks were fantastic. Before more people leave, I want to say just thank you. To yeah, you. Nice to meet you, Mr. Sums. I just kept on writing to Mr. Sums. You never <laughs> told me your name until today. All right, I'm going to switch to Gather, so I'll, yeah. I'll see you guys. Yeah, we can we can transition to gather for more discussion and so that people can ask you questions. Yeah, okay, you, you prefer to do that? Okay. But I want to just say thank you, Professor Sarnak, uh, Dr. Dr. Gina Sar, uh, Chris Budd, uh, Percy Diaconis. They, I don't think that they are around anymore, but thank you to all of our speakers, to all of our student speakers, uh, to the people who submitted artwork that was on display. Um, let's, let's head over to Gathertown. Okay. Well done.